Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this undergraduate town hall on student life and solving for fall. Uh, my name is Matthew Bauer uh, with DSL Communications, and I'll be the moderator for tonight's session. Um, as you may be able to tell from underneath the uh, video screen, we are crowdsourcing and upvoting questions. And behind the scenes, there's a team of student leaders and staff who are making sure that we answer a full range of questions about student life and uh, what MIT is thinking about for this fall. Um, so if you want to pose a question or upvote, uh, please make sure to use the interface under the video screen uh, and we'll get to as many questions as we possibly can. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Professor John Fernandez, who is the head of house for Baker House and the convener of the undergraduate heads of house, uh, to introduce himself and to help introduce our panelists for tonight. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are all thrilled to have you with us. We are thrilled to begin a process of co-designing the next academic year, and we're looking forward to working with you. As Matthew said, my name is John Fernandez. I'm a professor of architecture, and I've been the head of house at Baker House, and, and I'm speaking to you from Baker House today uh, for, the for the past five years. And I'm gonna have the, the panelists introduce themselves beginning with Mahi. Hello, my name is Mahi Lango, and I am the outgoing undergraduate association president. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nico Salinas. I'm a junior here, and I'm the president of the Interfraternity Council, the IFC. Hi, everyone. I'm David Friedrich. I'm Senior Associate Dean for Housing and Residential Services. Glad to be with you today. Hi, uh, I'm Pekko Hasoy. I'm the Associate Dean of Engineering, um, but today I'm wearing my IDSS hat, which is the Institute for Data Systems and Society. And I'm going to talk about some of the analysis that we've been doing, which may be helpful as we make decisions about what to do in the fall. Hi, everybody. My name is Raul Rodovitsky. I'm a professor in aeronautics and astronautics. And I'm also the um, head of house at McCormick Hall with my wife, Flavia. And I'm Cecilia Stopas. Hello, everyone. Good evening. And I am the medical director at MIT Medical, class of 1990. And hi, everyone. My name is Ayad Nuzamare. I'm the uh, outgoing president of the Dormitory Council. Thank you, everyone. So we're really looking forward to a productive session today. It, it will be just the beginning of many uh, sessions that we hope you will join with us in crafting our new reality for this upcoming academic year. So this town hall is focused on residential life on dorm living and independent living groups. And at the outset, I wanna make clear that there are many things that we don't know uh, and won't know for a while. There are lots of questions that we don't have answers to. Uh, questions like the, the details on what is dining gonna look like? How about rooming or the, the timing and the length of the semester, the financial and tuition consequences and, and much, much more. Um, we're, gonna do our, we're gonna do our best today to answer the questions that we can answer. But for some questions, the best will be to take note and find another time to get an answer to you. So please be patient with us. What we do know is that we need to consider a spectrum of possibilities for the fall. That spectrum includes on, on the one hand, no one on campus, everyone online in the fall. And on the other, so on the other end of that spectrum, everybody back on campus. Of course, everybody back on campus is a very challenging thing to do. No one on campus is not a reality that we want to have happen. So it's very likely that between these two extremes, there will be some intermediate solution to the fall. So to begin with, there's a lot of work has been done. And I want to highlight two websites for you. The first one, and please just go ahead and Google these. You'll find them right away. We Solve for Fall, MIT, which asks for ideas from you, from the, the community uh, as uh, broadly, but from you on a series of questions on values, housing, protective practices to enhance community health, and messaging and managing risk. 
So please take a look at that website, take a look at the questions there. That, that will be one of the frameworks that we use to move forward and design the fall and the academic year. The second website I'd like you to take a look at is um, highlights of the work that PECO referenced. So the IDSS Isolat program, and she'll talk more about that, but this program, the, the website offers various analyses, which I think will be very interesting to many of you on understanding our current situation, as well as the kinds of trade-offs and opportunities that are available to us now and will be available uh, under uh, various tracking regimes, testing and tracing programs. So please take a look at that. What we're doing today is starting the process of code designing the new reality of the coming academic year. I'm a designer, I'm an architect. Many of you are as engineers and, 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 and scientists even. So that you know that the number one principle in design is to include the user in the design process. So you, current students and new first years, you as past and future residents in dorms and independent, independent living groups are the primary users of those spaces. You're also the primary driver behind the making of community in residential life here at MIT. It's pretty clear that behavioral change and, and, and possibly pretty dramatic behavioral change will have to be a part of adjustments under social distancing that will include likely much lower density of use than you're, than you're used to, changes in the layouts of public spaces and more. So this town hall is the first step in hearing your thoughts on what these changes might be, how to achieve these changes, and then once the time comes to implement them in your own communities. We're very excited about the beginning of this process and we're looking forward and it may seem like a strange thing to say, but we're actually really looking forward to a great academic year ahead. It's gonna be a very different year but no less great than any other academic year at MIT. But for that to happen, we need your participation, your ideas, and your energy. In a moment, we're gonna go through a series of questions that are teed up um, to begin with. But before we do that, I wanna turn this over to Mahi and Nico for a few thoughts. Thank you, John. And thank you all for coming. Uh, as students on the panel, we wanted to say a few quick words. Uh, we recognize that MIT's depopulation of undergraduate residences several weeks ago may not have met your or my standards of transparency and equity. As student leaders, these past few weeks have further proven to us the need to include students in decision-making processes while they're happening. And that for some of our peers, COVID-19 has exposed inequities, such as difficult living situations at home that were previously made invisible. Going forward, we will continue to fight for both participatory decision-making transparency and equity. It is also important for us as undergraduates to set that example by being considerate and empathetic as we discuss specific possibilities for the fall. The UA, IFC, Panhill, Living Group Council, and Domkarn are here to advocate for you. Although the scale of this insurmountable task feels as though it overshadows any one individual, each and every one of your experiences and voices are important. Yeah, just to add on to this, that during this town hall, as John mentioned, uh, we do ask for student engagement during the panelist presentations, as well as during the following live Q&A session. Uh, we really appreciate MIT reaching out and including student leaders in the ongoing discussions. And our goal as student leaders in this town hall is to give all undergraduate students more voice and more volume uh, to engage as we solve for fall. And so with that, I'll pass it back to John. Thank you, Mahi and Nico. Um, and I'm just passing it right over to Matthew. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we really appreciate the comments. And uh, we're going to uh, start the session with uh, some questions that were submitted over the last week uh, through the We Solve for Fall Idea Bank. Uh, and in the meantime, as uh, participants uh, send in questions through the inter interface below the video screen, uh, Mahi and Nico and other folks behind the scenes will help to get those organized. So. Uh, our first few questions are uh, based on uh, your input from the uh, We Solve for Fall Idea Bank and questions. So I'm, I'm going to start with Raul Radovitsky, uh, head of house for McCormick, uh, with a question 
uh, that was submitted. What information, Raul, is being used to make decisions for the fall? And what's the timeline or when are those decisions being made? Thank you, Matthew. Um, so uh, speaking from McCormick Hall, hi everyone again. Um, so uh, the heads of house uh, have come up with a set of principles and values that we hope will form the basis for planning our, re our return to hopefully at some point full operations. Uh, these principles, uh, I'm gonna start with them. Uh, number one, and perhaps the most important one, we never say this enough. Uh, this is about you. You, the students are the lifeblood of this campus. Without you, we are stuck at a ground state of zero energy. Uh, we are committed to providing you with the most meaningful and enriching on-campus educational experience possible. Value number two, the residential experience is an invaluable part of an MIT education. It exposes students from all backgrounds to social and educational experiences that online education cannot provide and that exceed the formal content of the academic curriculum. It transforms lives. Value number three, residential communities at MIT are strong. Our thriving communities have repeatedly come together to address important challenges on our campus. We trust their ability to responsibly engage with MIT to respond to COVID-19 and its impact on residential life. Um, so what can be done? What are the challenges? How are, we going to, how are we going to succeed? Well, we are a large group of people working very hard to bring you back to campus as soon as possible and give you the college experience that you deserve while keeping you safe. We are privileged to have the technical and financial means to manage the risks involved. And we believe that the great opportunity we have is to bring our strong residential communities together and design our own return. We don't need to make assumptions about what is the right amount of social distancing, how much testing and tracing should be done. Our medical experts will decide and they will let us know, but they need to know what is possible and how much they can count on us. That is, in my view, our best contribution to inform our people doing the planning and making the decisions on what we are capable of as a community and what sacrifices we are willing to make to design our own return. How will we abide by hygiene, testing, distancing, tracing guidelines? Uh, how much we realize that the only way to succeed will be to take care of ourselves and each other. I'll give you an example of what we are doing at McCormick. We've been brainstorming with residents on what an archetypal day in our, our individual campus life looks like identifying sources of exposure. We're going to propose specific ways we can take care of ourselves and each other, and therefore perhaps enable interactions that may, be, may otherwise be impossible. Um, we welcome ideas, as John said. We also want to know uh, at what point um, it, it's just too much and not worth being here. I encourage you individually to engage with your living community and work on a plan for a return that meets certain constraints that will be provided by our medical experts. And I'm very optimistic that we can make this work. Let's do this, MIT. Thank, Thank you very much, Raul. Um, our next question goes to uh, Dean Pekka Bosoy and uh, Dr. Cecilia Stropas. It's a two-part question, and Pekka, I'll start with you. Uh, can you share with us a little bit about the work that you've been doing to better understand how the virus spreads, uh, as well as uh, what kind of interventions and policies uh, look like they, can, they, they might help? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, I actually just want to follow up on something that Raul said, which is that um, to give a shout out to my students who have been absolutely 
incredible this semester. Um, and you know, I think your response and your resilience is what gives me a lot of confidence that we're going to be able to do something really great in the fall. Um, so, uh, so having said that, which I think is the most important thing for me to say today, um, let me say a few words about testing. So IDSS has been doing um, analysis on a number of different fronts, which um, like John said, you can see on the website. Um, but today I want to focus on testing. And the message that I want you to take away is that um, testing is not just useful for identifying people who are sick and figuring out what kind of care they need. It is also one of our best levers for controlling the spread of the infection. So, um, so imagine the following. So, so, so you know that the way the virus spreads is if an infected person comes in contact with a susceptible person. Okay, um, and the infected people, for the purposes of this argument, there are two kinds of infected people you can think about. One is people who have symptoms, so they're sick or they have fevers or they're coughing, um, and uh, those people can go to MIT Medical, they can be identified, and um, MIT Medical is terrific at taking care of those people, right? So I feel like that population is in great hands, um, and so that's not the population I'm worried about. The population that worries me is the other one, which is the, the population of infected people who are asymptomatic and are still in, in, uh, immersed in the community, right? So these are people who don't necessarily know they have COVID, but are still contagious, right? And that's the dangerous part of the population that we have to control, okay? Um, and so th there are a number of ways to do this. Um, and so for starters, I think if somebody knew that they were dangerous, they would happily say, you know what, I'll take 14 days to sit by myself for a little while, let's not put my friends in danger, and then I'll come back once I've developed all those fabulous antibodies, right? Um, the trouble is that they don't know that they're contagious. So the only way you can do that um, is by testing people who are not showing symptoms, right? So that's the analysis that we did in IDSS, which is what fraction of the asymptomatic population do we need to test in order to control the spread? Um, and the good news is that um, I think that we have the capability to open up MIT to some degree because we have such fantastic testing capabilities. Um, and, the re and honestly, the reason we can do this is that we're very lucky. Um, and the reason that we're lucky is that the Broad Institute has been working day and night to increase their capabilities to process all of the tests. And MIT Medical has been working day and night to up increase their capability to put as many people, um, in, test as many people in the system as possible and working with us to figure out how do we prioritize who to test and who is most at risk. Um, so that's sort of an overview. The details of all of the calculations are, are on the website, um, but I wanted to get that on, on everybody's radar that um, you know, this is, this is something that is important to protect the community, right? So if you're asymptomatic and, um, uh, and you have the virus, um, for, for, from your point of view, it doesn't matter if you get tested. You're asymptomatic. Great. <laughs> Not a problem. The problem is to the rest of the, of the group. So I think, you know, like Raul said, this is a time when we're really going to have to think about how our, our actions impact the broader group um, and what we can do to make this work. Um, and with that, I think I'll pass back to Matt um, and have Cecilia talk a little bit about what the testing capabilities are going to be. Thank you, Peko. Yeah. So, Cecilia, what will testing and contract uh, contract contact tracing, sorry, look like on campus in the fall? And 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 how can folks in the audience reduce the risk of spread? And and how might this inform some of the decisions that are being considered and the scenarios that are on the table for the for this fall? So uh, thank you, Matt, and thank you, Peko, for that great explanation of why testing is so incredibly important. Uh, at MIT Medical, we've been very fortunate that we've been able to conduct testing since, at a high level, actually, a large amount of tests since early in April. And that has really allowed us to understand what it takes to do testing at a larger scale than you would normally see, for example, during the flu season when we you know, test the people who come into urgent care on a one-by-one -one basis based on only their symptoms. We've been doing surveillance testing at MIT Medical as part of a CUIS approved IRB study that we um, kicked off early in April. And it's helped us to understand what the um, workflow issues are in terms of doing large scale testing for uh, people on the MIT campus, which is in turn helping us understand what it will take to get larger and larger amounts of people back on campus. We all want people back on campus as soon as possible, and especially students, but we want to make sure we can do it in a way that reduces the risk for the members of the community to the greatest extent possible. 
So what testing is going to look like, I think, as we go forward from this point is that you know, we are at MIT Medical are, a, are able to offer uh, viral testing. So that's a diagnostic test looking for presence of the virus with our partners at the Broad. And we can do that by collect, we have to collect a sample to do that. Like almost any medical test, there's a sampling procedure that's involved. I'm happy to say that we have moved very recently, as in today, from the what's called the nasopharyngeal swab, which is a very uh, sort of a deep probing swab way into the back of the nose and throat area, to just swabbing the nostrils. And we think that um, as time goes on, there's gonna be other even potentially less invasive ways to conduct testing. But at the moment, our, our priority actually is to do an accurate test to the degree that we can. And we're confident that the test that we're using with the Broad is, um, is capable of doing that. And so we are gearing up to be able to test up to a thousand people a day. So if you could imagine uh, what that might look like. You know, we are working with all kinds of partners on campus. Um, Mark, P Professor Culpepper, for example, is helping us to outfit our new testing trailer, which sits outside of MIT Medical now, that we are going to be opening up to help us increase the throughput for testing because we recognize that where we're doing it now, which is an outdoor tent, is not a really a good solution for the long term. So that's the, the viral testing capability. We are, you know, going to be constrained a bit in terms of the number of tests that we can provide based on how quickly we can do tests and how many people we have test, uh, collecting the samples. And so until we get to a point where we have a very good, um, some other kind of option with what we have now, that, that is the constraint. And that's one of the numbers that Pecco and her team are working with to um, understand how do we prioritize within our population who we want to test. And we're thinking very carefully about, uh, about that. And a lot of that is a risk stratification exercise. We want to make sure that people who are at high risk, uh, should they contract the disease, um, have access to tests. And also, if there are people who are in particular situations where they might be at a higher risk of spreading it to many other people around them are, are also another group that we're considering. We get a lot of questions about antibody testing, and that is not something that we are offering yet, but I expect that that will be part of of the future for MIT. Uh, one of the issues with antibody testing right now is that um, it's not really helpful information to us because it's really a look back. It just, it tells us who has been infected, but we don't fully understand whether a person who has been infected previously actually has immunity. And so it's really more of a, an, a, a way to satisfy one's curiosity about whether they either had it or not. And at the moment, not part of our offering, but I suspect that will be part of the offering in the future. And then talking about contact tracing, this is probably the most critical public health offering that we have at MIT Medical. It, right now during a pandemic, it's, it's the thing that really can make a difference. And what that means is that we are um, really kind of bumping up our staff to be able to have enough people who can contact uh, people who have a positive test to find out who they may have been in contact with in the you know, day or two before that positive test uh, was found, we found out about the positive test, so that we can then turn around and test those people. And that's really critical because we want to be able to um, understand what the, the transmission has been to others if, you know, in, in the circle of uh, around the uh, first person. Uh, because every one of those people that we can uh, then uh, have be self-isolating so that we don't have further spread is a, is a critical way that we can uh, slow the spread of the pandemic. So um, that's how we can do our part. And I think the key thing is, is in terms of you know, keeping everyone healthy on campus, the, the best way we can do that is to follow the public health guidance that MIT Medical is issuing, that the Cambridge Department of Public Health is issuing, that the uh, state of Massachusetts is, is issuing. And right now that's things like wearing a mask at all times and washing your hands, wiping down surfaces frequently, staying home if you're sick. Um, all the things that we've been talking about now for I think three months uh, in total, those are all are gonna continue to be important even as we come back to campus in the fall. So those are, uh, and it's gonna take all of us, it's gonna take every member of the MIT community uh, doing all of those things to care for every other person around them in the community. Great, great. Uh, Pecco, Cecilia, thank you so much for that. Thanks. Our next questions are about housing uh, and David Friedrich from HRS and DormCon President Ayadin Uzamare. Uh, these are for you, David, let's start with you. Um, as you look ahead to the fall, can you tell the folks uh, watching uh, a little bit about what HRS, uh, the steps that you're taking uh, to promote safety in the residence halls and in FSILGs? 
Sure, thanks, Matthew. Um, there are a number of initiatives that are underway to help us support the health and safety of on-campus residents as we think through various scenarios for the fall. Um, we're continuing to seek input from students, uh, both in the residence halls and in the FSILGs, about how best to approach um, the challenges associated with planning. Um, with guidance from MIT Medical, from the med um, emergency management folks, leadership at the Institute, we're developing a framework for ways to effectively manage residential spaces with the understanding that specific solutions really need to be tailored to the variety of settings where students live, whether they live on campus or in an FSILG. And as we work to implement new ways of living together, local adoption of the policies and procedures needed um, will really have to be coordinated closely with DormCon, with the house execs, with the heads of house, with the FSILG students and the alumni. And we're gonna to continue to partner with all of those important partners and work together to support the plans as they develop and are put into place. Um, additional policies are currently in effect right now across the undergraduate on-campus emergency housing in an effort to reduce the potential for any community spread of COVID-19 through person-to-person -person contact. So some of these policies include things like, obviously physical distancing practices are in effect, face coverings are required in the residential common areas and in public spaces. Overnight visitors or guests from outside one's residence hall are not permitted. Um, common areas have been closed and in-person residential social events are not permitted. And the residential dining areas are also closed and food is being packaged up and um, available for individual pickup for those living in housing. We're continuing to evaluate the effectiveness of these policies and have been gathering input and feedback from the students who are living in emergency housing, really trying to understand what is it like to live in this setting and um, with these added restrictions, because this input is gonna be really important as we consider any potential changes or additions that can support this continued goal of working to minimize risk to the residential community and to plan effectively for the fall housing scenarios. Um, the team across the Housing and Residential Services has been reviewing how certain common areas and residence halls um, would operate. These are things like the laundry rooms and elevators and mail areas and fitness rooms in order to make sure that we're maintaining good practices around physical distancing. Um, we're taking in feedback from students and developing a framework for guidance um, and how that guidance from government and MIT Medical and Emergency Management can help inform that local implementation. We've increased um, a number of our services within each of the residence halls. We're working closely with the house operations managers and housekeeping staff to sustain increased cleaning of surfaces and high traffic areas. These are things like the handrails and elevators and door handles to disinfect them more regularly. We provided all students that are residing on campus with face coverings. Uh, we've added hand sanitizing stations throughout the public spaces and signs are posted about proper hand washing. We've also done some things that are maybe a little less visible and had um, made sure that our staff know how to um, direct students who may have concerns about coronavirus or to know the resources that are available to them to make sure that they're following the directives of MIT Medical. And I just want to say, you know, I, I really want to thank and acknowledge the students who are currently living on campus right now for their goodwill during a challenging time and certainly in some challenging circumstances. And I also want to express real gratitude for the many dedicated staff members who continue to work each and every day in support of the residential buildings and the residents who live there. So there's a lot to be done as we think about the fall. Um, it's going to be really important that we're partnering together in how we make living at MIT a safe and rewarding experience. Thanks, David. Uh, so Ayodhan, to you, can you share a little bit about how students can build community uh, this coming fall, regardless of whether classes are online, some students are on campus, or everybody comes back? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think this is a really important conversation to have, especially having it be uh, student propelled going forward. Because I think, uh, as many undergraduates know, the places that we live, especially for uh, residences on campus, they're more than just a building, it's uh, a family uh, support structure. And I think it's important that we not only try to maintain that, uh, that it already exists for us as uh, upperclassmen, but also try to incorporate the first years that are coming that may have not had the ability to be there physically. Uh, try to bring them into these communities uh, and have them understand this aspect of student life at MIT that's so important. Um, 
we as DormCon are working pretty closely with HRS, with Division of Student Life, to see if there's any way we can facilitate more of these uh, like inter-community connections and this outreach to first years uh, from current students, see if we can facilitate that type of interaction uh, virtually. Um, it's going to be uh, a united effort really across the board between not just administration and DormCon, but also within yourselves, within members of your dormitory governments. Uh, and so I just encourage you to think of what made you feel comfortable to join the place that you're living today? What are the things that have made you feel like a community member here at MIT? Um, and band together with your groups uh, inside of your dorms, across campus, work with your dormitory governments uh, and work with us, DormCon, so that we can basically build as good as possible virtual structures to uh, make incoming first years and make ourselves still feel uh, like we are that community, which we still are. All right, thank you both very much. We got one more question going to John Fernandez. Uh, John, what steps are being taken to keep students engaged with their campus communities and the decision-making process overall? Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of um, interaction with student communities on an ad hoc basis. So Raul's in touch with his community, uh, Malvina and I, the two heads of house here, Baker are in touch with our communities. Uh, DormCon has been meeting, the execs of, of various houses are meeting. Um, and so a lot of that is happening, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the formal structure of engaging with students, because I think this leads to what we are planning to do really right away, uh, beginning next week. So there are a number of planning teams that have been working here at MIT for weeks. They're working along multiple fronts, um, and a lot of it is under the mantle of continuity. In other words, the activities here at MIT have scaled down, but they haven't stopped. So there's a, an element of continuity and ramping up now. Those groups are uh, groups looking at the academic continuity, uh, research continuity, um, the, the research efforts here at MIT are gonna begin to open up and ramp up. Uh, they already have started and, and they will continue um, through the summer. Um, so all of that is happening, um, but I wanna highlight one group, uh, it's called Team 2020. Um, it's led by the Vice Chancellor, Ian Waits. Susie Nelson and I are both part of that group. And that group is orchestrating the complex interac interactions between all these continuity groups, so all the work that they're doing, and all the other groups, PECO's group and other groups that are looking into the problem, analyzing and simulating possibilities. And all that work is being taken into the Team 2020 group um, and synthesized and is now um, ready for a design effort. In other words, we could analyze this for a long time, no question about that. But we need to get going with designing the fall and the academic year. So as part of Team 2020's charge, we've developed an engagement plan, which will be released very soon, um, announced and released. The major elements of that plan have to do with a series of workshops. They're being called charrettes, which kind of warms my heart because that actually comes from architecture originally. Um, uh, but a charrette is a French word used in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris about an intensive design session where in just a few hours, you design the whole thing, you put it on paper and you submit it. That's the idea behind these design sessions, these charrettes that are gonna start uh, next week, later next week, and go through the end of May. There will be four of them. Each one will be a two hour session, obviously here on Zoom. Um, and they're gonna be looking at the dominant scenarios that are being considered, the ones that I described at the beginning of this, the 0%, 100%, things in between, uh, the various timing of students coming onto campus, the various densities of students on campus, pretty much everything. So the three, the first three uh, workshops will be those three dominant scenarios. The fourth one will be open to an alternative scenario. It's kind of an open design session. N having gone through those three, knowing what we know, now is there another way to uh, open in the fall? 
these working sessions are going to be facilitated, um, uh, and and they're they're going to start off with a sampling of questions like, um, what would it take for this scenario to be successful for you personally? What would it take for for this scenario to be successful for your um, uh, your living arrangement, your your dorm, let's say? Who are the people who would actually struggle the most under different scenarios? And once you know who those people are, what we, what can we do about it? How can we moderate the the difficulties that that may po may be posed? Um, timing for all of this is critical. Um, you know, it's it's the nature of work here at MIT that things just get done and they just get done and you throw them out there and we all consider it and that's how we're moving forward. So as I said, this, this is gonna happen to the end of May. And then after that process, there will be a series of small group discussions, first week of June, where we share the findings and other groups will meet like uh, uh, fraternity members, um, members of a floor or of a cluster or of an entry. And that's all in the planning stages. So please look out for that. Um, keep in mind that the success of this, as has been mentioned a couple of different times, is entirely based on the intensity of participation that we get. So we really, really need your participation. I know it's gonna be coming to you, the current students, right after your finals, but it's really important to shaping the next academic year. And we really strongly encourage that you sign up to join us. All right, John, thank you very much. Um, we are going to now shift to the live questions that we've got coming in from, uh, from the viewers. So um, uh, John, we'll go right back to you with the first question. Um, if only some students are allowed to come back for different half semesters or trimesters, how will it be decided who gets to come back and when? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, and anyone else that wants to chime in, please do, uh, because I'm gonna offer a, a few very short thoughts. First, in anything that we do, the decision of who's on campus is gonna be driven by the risk balanced by the educational value, right? And you know, for graduate students, that's the risk balanced by the, the research value. So, so there, there is a balance there. Um, the, it's as already stated by Peko and Cecilia, it's gonna be based on a really effective testing regime, in, as well as tracking and tracing, if, if tracing is, is required. Um, but there are some teaching considerations. So remember that bringing students to campus is not just about being here in residential life, it's also about interacting with the faculty and being in classes. So. We, we do know now, um, there's been a lot of discussions with the faculty about the coming academic reality. And so there is a very strong prioritization of learning that requires physical interactions to be on campus. So many lectures, some recitations, if they can be online, they will be online. So obviously project-based learning and project-based uh, types of, of, of uh, classes and, maybe will be the, the priority. So you can imagine a scenario in which, like for example, first years and seniors are on campus together. Now, why would that be possible? Or maybe what, why would that be a scenario? Well, so one idea here that's floating around and we're, we're, gonna, and we're gonna examine it in the charrettes and, and, and it's being modeled is what's the potential for pods or virtual families? So these are organized groups within which there's a possibility that social distancing might be relaxed. Don't know how much and, and how would that, that would happen, but that the borders of that group, the membrane, let's say, it, it does not allow any other members to come in and no member of that group can interact with any other individual or any other pod. So that's a possibility because if you have first years taking all the same GIRs, that might be something that you know you could form a pod out of. Or if you have seniors, for example, in different departments that have project-based classes, capstone classes, that's also a real possibility to, to move forward on. So it's 
so I'll, I'll leave it at that, but certainly, but to say that this is certainly going to be one of the design elements in the, in the upcoming shreds. Yeah, Anyone I else want to offer? Yeah, I, I could probably also comment on that. It, it's an interesting um, optimization uh, question as to which classes would be back when, if you had, say, three semesters throughout the year. And you can think about organizing it by major, by class year, by other ways. Um, but th those are all things that we have the ability to um, test, but where we really do need the input from students. So, for example, you can imagine that there's something just um, unique and special and irreplaceable about the very first semester that you have on campus as a first year student. Um, so that might be something that we want to preserve. Uh, then there are also things that might be quite valuable that for seniors or juniors or you know others, you know, if they were to do the first two semesters but not the third, you could imagine getting a, a big jump start on summer employment or other things like that. So there's there's a whole set of things that we really need input from students on as to what are the desirable modes of operating a curriculum like that. And you know the only the only part about it that's hard is we have to you know figure it all out in a week or two. Um, but beyond that, it's sort of a, an exciting set of things to sort of uh, think about. Um, so this is why it's just uh, critical, as, as uh, John said. Um, uh, we've had a, a lot of help from John and from Caesar McDowell um, and and Kate Trimble and uh, and others on how to effectively design these charrettes and community engagement opportunities so that we can get that kind of input that we need on some of those important structural questions. Great, thank you both. Yeah, so actually, I, can I just jump in re just really quick? <laughs> Sorry, Matt. <laughs> um, just to say, I just want to second what John and Ian both said that um, our primary um, activity right now at IESS is starting to model these pod, these sort of pod structures um, and to build an infrastructure that will allow us to test different ideas that come in from the community and to understand you know what are the testing protocols we need to keep everything safe and what is the structure we need on campus to keep things from spreading so we're eager to hear from you um, and eager to put that into the models to see how they come out all right thank you all very much so our next question is for david friedrich david if mit is all virtual would there be a way for students considering a gap semester slash leaving to re, uh, retain guaranteed housing in this, you know, under these unprecedented circumstances? This is a great question. I mean, there's so many variables at play here that um, we have to consider, and we're gonna be obviously looking at the um, decisions that are made around the academic program and what that looks like in terms of how we're doing housing. Um, you know. If it's all virtual, I think it's a reasonable thought that it, we would continue to um, guarantee the housing for those that maybe are not on campus for that term. But what it looks like for us to ramp back up to full housing will be um, you know, something that still has to be developed. I think the one thing though I do wanna make sure is clear in, in what I'm answering here is that anybody who wants to live on campus, when we're fully back up and running, we're gonna do everything we possibly can to get them in. Great. Um, so our next question is for Ian. Uh, Ian, um, uh, sorry, um, oh, will MIT still provide financial aid for housing, food, and other living expenses if fall is fully online? Um, as we did when we uh, moved people um, off campus quickly, we uh, really want to ensure that our students um, can be happy, healthy, and successful wherever they are, where they're while they're still our students. Um, so I think it may look different than what it does now because the needs will be different, but we um, fully intend to continue to be uh, supportive of all the students um, in, our, in our community um, throughout this uh, sort of challenging time. All right, great, thank you. Um, our next question is uh, for uh, David Friedrich again. What's the status of Burton Connor House? Is there any chance it will be open to students to live in it before it's, it gets renovated? So um, this is another really great question. And, and certainly as we look at the various models for how we can accommodate different sized populations for next year, um, we're looking at a lot of different things. Um, we don't have a clear answer on that right now. As you may know, um, Burton Connor has been designated as the support residence where if we need to um, accommodate a student who needs to self-isolate um, because they have contracted COVID-19, 
19, that is where they would stay and get support. Um, we'll have a continued need for that in the fall. It has not been, um, the final decision has not been made about uh, where that in fact will be happening. But what we're committed to is continuing the work that we've been doing over the last year and a half at this point with the Burton Connor community and the Burton Connor transition team to uh, make sure that we're uh, taking in the input, the concerns, the questions from that community, making sure that we're continuing the work of supporting the community no matter what the future holds. We have done a lot of work to think about how that community can sustain itself um, during the disruption of the renovation. And one key thing that I know is important to students is that we had planned for a, a timeline to reopen Burton Connor for the fall of 2022. And we wanna make sure we do everything we possibly can to keep that timeline on, on track so that that uh, doesn't get disrupted by this. So a lot of variables, very much committed to continuing to work with the community on those questions about what the future of Burton Connor is. All right, great. Um, this is a question for, I think, both Susie and Ian. Uh, are there concerns that too many students will take semesters off, causing capacity issues later? And what is being or will be done to assess that risk and manage it? So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead, Ian. No, no, go ahead. You, you can answer the hard ones. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming to you next. Um, so I, I just wanted to say, you know, there is no crystal ball that tells us exactly what students are going to do. But Ian can talk a little bit about the yield and how positive it is for our incoming new students. We do have a survey, um, Jag Patel helped us with a survey of, and we, we um, just did this, just finished this up, 11,500 grads, new grad students, uh, current graduate students and undergraduate students. And they were asked, you know, what are your plans for the fall? And 65%, um, around 65%, a good return rate, 57% uh, return rate, around 65% of students said they're interested in on-campus, undergraduates said they're interested in on-campus residence hall housing if they're permitted to come back and it's safe. Um, as you know, a lot of our students live in FSILGs. That wasn't part of the question. It was on, on campus residents. Um, so we think that students will be very interested in coming back to campus if we can design a great fall experience, um, although it might be different than uh, past fall experiences. Yeah. But Ian, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, well, so our, our current policy on students taking leave of, leaves of absence and deferrals is that uh, we just act in their best interests. And, and we, we tend to be very flexible to the point that, because uh, it's only a couple people a year, uh, but who will you know call us up, let's say on Labor Day or something and, and say, hey, I, I'm gonna defer for the rest of the year. And I think one of the things that will change um, this year is to try and move that uh, backward in time a little bit, or you know, to just ask for some um, commitments from students um, soon enough that we can effectively plan the housing because things are so different and, and we do anticipate that, you know, there may be students who, you know, look at the um, opportunities in front of them and say, well, I'd rather do, do something um, different. So I think the way we'll handle it is to still give that level of flexibility to the students, but maybe ask for a little bit more advanced notice um, than we um, typically um, uh, ask for, just given the, the uh, numbers of people who, who may have an interest in deferring. Great. Uh, next question for, is for Cecilia. Uh, Cecilia, what makes you confident that if students are brought back, we would be able to avoid having to kick everyone off campus again, should there be, a, for example, an, another outbreak? I think confident is a difficult word in a pandemic. I, I will start with that. So um, I think we are trying to do risk assessment and our, our goal is to make choices that keep the risk as low as possible for all members of the MIT community. I think the one thing that we have going for us at MIT is that we do have really the ability to do widespread testing uh, for many members of our community every single week. Um, and that is one thing that could make a difference in terms of our ability to keep everyone on campus. But we don't have, con we, have to, we have to recognize you know, that there's a lot of uncertainty and there's things that could be going on around campus that we have no control over. For example, if there were to be a very large, um, you know, widespread community transmission through, you know, with a spike in Cambridge and a spike in Boston and all the other universities, 
also had spikes in cases. We would we, we, we are not immune from what is going on in the community around us. And that is not something that is in our control. We can only control what we can control. So we can control how we test, how we uh, do contact tracing, and then how we um, treat our, our, our members of our community. And when we treat, we're talking about treatment, we are talking about things like quarantine and isolation for people who may have COVID-19 or who have been diagnosed with COVID-19 because those are proven techniques to help prevent the, the transmission of the virus. So I think, you know, again, it, there's a lot of uncertainty and we're trying to be very transparent about that, but we don't want to be so draconian about it that nobody gets to come back to campus. I think that's really one of the things that we're really strong, you know, thinking about what is a, a reasonable level of risk that we're comfortable with. Great, Cecilia, uh, stay right there. I've got a question for oh, you. Sure. Uh, given For you and John, given that we are expecting a second wave in the fall, should we also consider that the spring semester might be altered in some way? I think, I think that we have to be open and honest that that is certainly a possibility, but we, it's not something we're gonna be able to predict in May of 2020, right? There's too many, there's too many variables here to, to be able to, to accurately know what's gonna happen um, you know, 10 months from now or eight months from now. So, so it's possible. So we would have to, to, the truthful answer is we would have to consider that it might have to be altered. But we should be okay with that. Um, do the benefits outweigh the risks, I think is one of the things. Yeah, uh, adding to that, um, you know, it's in, in designing anything, there's a set of performance functions. And if, if one of the performance functions has to do with scaling down rapidly, or, you know, or in the positive scenario, let's say a vaccine gets developed suddenly and it's available and it's uh, ramping up really rapidly. That sort of agility in the system that we design is gonna be extremely important for us to have. Clearly, the, the exodus from campus of 95% of the undergraduates was, was a really difficult thing to do. Everybody rallied and did it, but in doing it, it was really hard. So we want to be prepared, at the very least, with the protocols, the 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 prepositioned assets, um, the procedures, so that if we do need to do that again, we can do it in a very organized way. And 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 the community is aware that that might be something that that might have to have happen. So again, in the charrettes that we're going to run, that's definitely going to be one of the performance functions that will be on the table. Can I also just share? Hey, Matt. Oh. I just, I just wanted to share, tagging onto something that Cecilia said, you know, what are the things we can control? And I wanted to connect back to Raul's words um, much earlier in this uh, uh, webinar. And, and that's that um, one of the most important things that the community control is, is their social distancing and their behaviors and things like that. So, so having, you know, people within the residences uh, really agreeing to certain kinds of behaviors makes Cecilia's job much easier. It makes the heads of house job much easier. It dramatically lowers the risk uh, that you have. Um, and it's notwithstanding that yet yeah, things may happen at other universities, but, but a lot of what happens at MIT, um, we or you are, are in control of. Um, so so that's, I, I think that is really a nugget that, that we need just help and commitment from the students in terms of, you know, wh what what can you do um, to 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 really make this work? And uh, can I? I just want to just quickly add one other thing. So, so first, that's a super important point that that Ian just made because you know w whether or not something spreads is going to be largely dependent on the be the culture and the behavior of the people on campus. Um, but I also wanted to to go back to the original question and about whether we would sh shut things down in the fall. And like Cecilia said, there's a lot of uncertainty, but we are also not in the same position we were at the beginning of March, right? We have a lot of testing facilities in place now. We have a lot of capability at MIT Medical. We now have the population is more educated. People know the value of wearing masks. You know the value of social distancing. So, you know, I think even if there was a spike in the, in the fall, um, we are the the situation is not the same as we were in earlier this semester. Thank you all. Um, Ian, uh, uh, back to you. Will the cost of attendance be reduced in the event that the semester is fully remote or partially remote? Well, we don't we don't know. The the uh, 
what we have to do first is decide how can we best deliver on our mission um, in a very uncertain time. And, and then we need to sit down and um, evaluate all of the sort of costs, the financial impacts and things like that of those, of those different options. Um, so right now our focus is really squarely on supporting um, our grad and undergrad population um, now and throughout the summer and, and really deciding what, what option best enables us to um, you know, deliver on MIT's mission through the pandemic. And, and then we have to sit down and, and um, look at uh, those questions. I say we, we are working very hard to deliver a, you know, a, a MIT quality educational experience um, in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, but, but those are all questions for us to look at um, later in time. Great, we're, uh, we're coming up close on the top of the hour um, and we still have a number of questions to get through. So I'm gonna shift to lightning round mode if everybody is okay with that. Um, so this one is for uh, Nico and David Friedrich. Um, quickly, will FSILGs be assessed differently than dorms in terms of how safe they may be to return? Uh, yeah, I can just speak from a student perspective. Uh, we definitely are looking at that because we understand that a lot of FSLGs have different constraints of with their own uh, housing situations that are then are different from dorms. So we're looking at it from a sustainability and financial uh, perspective to also just a facilities and operational standpoint. I'll just add quickly that we've learned a lot about um, how to best manage residential spaces and look forward to partnering um, with the FSILG community on how those practices can be best implemented to just look out for the safety and well-being of anybody who lives there. Um, we do have to think about this as a system. It's the on-campus and FSILGs together that provide the ma vast majority of the housing for our students. And so it's an important partnership. All right, uh, Cecilia and Ian, do you have updates on digital contact tracing and how to scale up NAS testing on campus? Uh, so what I would say with regards to digital contact tracing is there are a, a lot of options that we're considering is probably the best way to think about it. And we are thinking about how best we could use those at MIT, given, uh, you know, what, what we're trying to accomplish at MIT, you know, privacy concerns. There's a lot of issues around digital contact tracing that we need to understand um, how we can best adapt that technology to serve the MIT community in the, in the way that it expects. In terms of scaling up of mass testing, I think a lot of that is going to be uh, dependent upon the kinds of tests that are available to us to conduct and the level of accuracy that we uh, have uh, with those tests. So we want to make sure they're reliable and that we can get uh, good solid answers back on them in a timely fashion. So uh, more, more, to, more to follow on that. So stay tuned. Great. Uh, so Ian and Susie, uh, what have you learned from how the past few weeks have gone that you'll be cognizant of and actualize going forward, including if this if there is a second wave? Ian, why don't you go ahead and take that first and I'll you know, go second. I guess what have we learned that um, if we have to, I, I guess what I learned is yeah, um, there's lots of parts of MIT that really can execute very effectively, students, faculty, and staff alike. Um, but boy, we would sure like to have more notice than we had um, the last time around, right? It was painful for everyone. Um, but I think what we learned is that all, everybody at MIT will pull together and, and we can deliver. I also, what I, one of the things I love, I have to say, is you know, people ask questions like, when will decisions be made for the fall? And what I love about MIT is people sort of get the, the complexity of it, that right now it's better to plan vigorously, solve five different problems at once, um, and, and continue to collect new information from the world, and then as long as possible, or as late as possible, make that decision between those options when you have the most information and you've had the most sort of in-depth uh, planning around those th those different options. So people sort of get that. It's an uncomfortable thing because we all want to find the answer, what's it going to be, and, and things. But, you know, it, it, it's nice that people appreciate um, the challenge and the complexity of all of this and and know that um, we all have to work hard together to, to, to just help solve the problem. So. So uh, what I've learned, uh, thanks for that, Ian, is um, we have extraordinary people at MIT. We have extraordinary students. It was remarkable what we were able to do as quickly as we were able to do it. 
And um, I, I really want, I hope you could reach out and thank the people in the residence halls in particular, our cleaning staff, our dining workers, um, the people who helped to move students out, whether they were students or, or staff. They worked uh, unbelievable hours to make that all happen and tried their best to do it in a way that was, you know, they were just under considerable uh, duress. It was very difficult. So what I learned is we are a great community and when, when we have to, we can pull together and we can uh, help each other. Great, so we've got two more questions and then uh, we're gonna wrap it up. I apologize, we're gonna go a little bit past the top of the hour, but a lot of great questions coming in. So um, uh, for Ian and John, um, the question was already asked, but it wasn't really answered uh, about when a final decision on the fall will be made. Yeah, I, I think you can expect just because we need to be able to uh, put plans in place that by late June or early July um, announcements will have to be made. Um, but as I as I just said, the the more time we have to analyze and assess and understand and to also collect information from this rapidly changing world, um, the better off we are in making those decisions. So it really is our desire, I think, to push the decisions. Um, back as far as we can into that time window. Um, so, you know, if the assignment's due at midnight, we're going to try and get it in 11.59. Okay, and our last question for John and Raul. Uh, you all have said you care about crafting solutions with student feedback. How should we give feedback, and are there any guarantees we will be listened to? Well, well, I could I can start very quickly to say, uh, you you have our guarantee you will be listened to. I mean, I think we can just say say that straight up, and we we are, we really need your input. So boy, will we listen to you? That's that's for sure. Of course, not everything can be done, and there, there are dozens of variables here, but we you will certainly be listened to. I'll leave it at that, Raul. Please. Um. What I would add to what John said is that if you have anything to contribute, if you have any thoughts, if you have any questions, don't keep them to yourselves. Use every possible, possible vehicle of communication you have, uh, whoever you feel comfortable with, whether that's your GRA or your Arlar or your head of house or your advisor or your house gov in your community uh, or email me directly. Uh, just don't keep it to yourself. Uh, we need the input. We need the, enga the engagement. And to add to that, the idea bank and the We Solve for Fall. And again, we've mentioned it many times, but participation in the upcoming charrettes happening starting next week. Please participate. I'd actually like to comment on that real quick. Um, so as an undergrad, I completely relate to the idea that at many points it feels like you know, you can kind of just, you know, scream into the void all you want, but then, uh, you know, answers to your problems aren't really uh, solved. Um, this is why student government exists. Um, we exist to be an extension of you that can directly interface with administrators. Um, if there is anything that you have, not even just in this uh, specific uh, crisis, but in general, that is that is why we exist. You come to us. We try to work with you to, to, to brainstorm, to develop solutions to these problems. So if anything, I encourage you to be active with uh, these branches of student government, DormCon, UA, uh, IFC, Panhel, uh, because that's why we're here. Great, thank you all very much. So uh, to those of you who submitted questions and we weren't able to get to your question, uh, uh, please know there will be more opportunities uh, for you to interact with uh, student and campus leaders coming up very soon. So, um, you know, please uh, know that you, you you will have more opportunities to ask your questions. Um, I think for some final uh, thoughts, I'm just going to turn it over to Susie Nelson. Thanks so much, Matthew. Um, Matthew and John and Mahi and Nico, thanks for hosting uh, today. You did a great job. And many thanks to our panelists, uh, uh, you know, for all your remarks and responses to the questions, and of course, to our audience for uh, joining us and asking the questions. You know, what Aiden said, I think really um, rings true for me right now. Uh, it has definitely been a year of change. And even in the best of times, 
uh, you know, we have different voices and come, we're coming from different places and have different objectives. And I think people always have the best of intentions, but it doesn't always come across that way. But what I really liked about uh, Iaden's comment is that this, this whole town hall, this solve for fall exercise, um, the idea bank, that was born out of a discussion with student leaders um, who had asked that, that even if we don't have answers, can you at least share the questions? So we all know what MIT is grappling with. And so that's how this all came about. Um, we will absolutely listen to you, um, but it's it's going to be a tough year for all of us because it's uncertain. And if there's any group I want to be in this with, it's uh, the group from MIT because this is a community who really does know how to work hard and think analytically about difficult problems. So we appreciate your feedback and um, hope you join us for future conversations. And just wanna thank you again uh, for tuning in and, and all who've been working on this problem together. Thanks everyone and have a good night.